Welcome to One Million Cups. Um, we, uh, my name is Toby, and I'm a, one of the organizers here, along with Milton, Courtney, and Brian. You're prompting me on your name, yeah. And uh, so raise your hand if this is your first time here. All right, welcome. Yeah. Yes. Nice round of applause. Raise your hand if it's been like more than a month and you've come back. All right. Did Nate raise his hand? That's what I'm wondering. Thanks, Nate. All right, so uh, just in case you aren't sure where you are, this is One Million Cups, and it's a weekly educational event where we have two entrepreneurs come up here and speak for six minutes, and then there's uh, the panel, which we'll introduce to you here in just a minute, and then you get a chance to ask some Q&A as well. Um, before we get started with introducing the panel and the first thing, Brian has a quick announcement. Um, thank you guys for coming out. Um, before we get started today, I wanted to do a special, I wanted to, to recognize one of our team members who, who is leaving at the end of the week. Her name is Taylor Brown. I think she's in the audience. Hi, Taylor. Taylor, come up here real quick. Let's hear it for Taylor. Taylor is, works for <laughs> Kaufman Foundation. She, she's involved in kind of the infrastructure of the um, One Million Cups community, and she's very involved in the other cities. And Taylor is moving on to... H&R Block. Okay, so if you see Taylor on the side of the street saying, come do your tech, no, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. No, it sounds like a great opportunity. We're going to miss you. And before I let you go, I want to give you one of these. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been here more than 10 times, so... So let's hear it for now Taylor. Hopefully club. she'll come visit us. Thank you, Taylor. Excellent. So now we're going to have the folks that are on the expert panel stand up and uh, do a quick intro. Good morning. I'm Lawrence Andre, Kansas City's personal leadership trainer, currently on an epic entrepreneurial quest to transform leaders leadership development industry. Good morning. I'm Mindy Hart with Essential Foundations for Business, helping you with all of your organizational development and marketing public relations needs. Um, I'm also the Associate Director of the Entrepreneurial Leadership Project at Mid-America Nazarene University, which is a Fast Track affiliate. And I have a couple Fast Track graduates that are in the room. If you guys want to raise your hand and wave to everybody, yay! Um, some exciting things are coming up from some of those graduates very shortly, but... In September, we have another Fast Track class starting, so you're welcome to go to the FastTrack.org website and get registered for your entrepreneurial journey. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Without any further delay, we're going to have the folks from Volunteer Local come on up and get us started. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for having us here. I'm Kaylee Williams. And I'm Jenny Williams. No, no relation. relation. And we are Volunteer Local, a volunteer management software company that was built in Des Moines, Iowa. Behind every great event, there are happy volunteers. This is something that we know to be true here at Volunteer Local. We also know that behind Every great volunteer force, there is usually one very stressed out volunteer coordinator. In January, I met a volunteer coordinator by the name of Sammy Slovey. Sammy managed over 2,000 volunteers for the Governor's Ball Music Festival in New York City. When Sammy discovered Volunteer Local, it was a night and day difference for her. So much, in fact, I actually asked Sammy if she would be willing to share with me a little bit more about her volunteer recruitment process before she found Volunteer Local. To which she replied, Kaylee, you have no idea. This is a conversation that we have again and again with volunteer coordinators who are overworked, overwhelmed, and tired of spreadsheets. The volunteer coordinators have a pretty daunting task ahead of them. They have to manage all these volunteers, and we call them uh, these big challenges that they're facing, the big five. These are the big five problems that we're solving for our customers. First, scheduling trying to arrange thousands of volunteers into jobs and shifts that you need them to work for your event based on their skills, their interest, and of course their availability is incredibly difficult. Communication cannot be overstated during, before, and of course after the event is over. 
And that leads right into hourly tracking, letting your volunteers know how many hours they gave individually. And of course, it's important for the event coordinators to know how many hours of labor did it take to make my event happen. Of course, we wouldn't have a list if we didn't have no-shows. People will sign up for a job and a shift and then not show up for any number of reasons. Does the coordinator have a plan in place for when that does happen? And do they have the resources they need on site to reallocate people to fill the gaps? Finally, appreciation. Saying thank you. We know at Volunteer Local that when our coordinators send a thank you email after the event is over, they see higher volunteer retention rates year over year. Now these big five challenges can have real world implications. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lollapalooza. It happens in Chicago every year. This year, a storm rolled through Lollapalooza during the middle of the event. Uh, there was thunder and lightning and there was hail and they had to evacuate 90,000 people. In that terrifying instance, does the volunteer coordinator have the tools they need to streamline that evacuation to make sure that everybody gets home safe, including their volunteers? So why is this important? Well, we have come to learn that there is this thing called the volunteering threshold. And what this is, is basically the minimum amount of time that a person needs to dedicate towards volunteer activities in order to reap these amazing health benefits that come with volunteering. These benefits include increase in happiness, a greater functional ability later in life, and it's even been shown that people who volunteer tend to live longer. So this is really great for us to know because at Volunteer Local, one of our main goals is to get more people volunteering more often. And how do we do that? Volunteer Local is a scheduling software that streamlines the volunteer sign-up and registration process. Unlike a lot of similar products on the market, we don't require the volunteers to create a username and a password on Volunteer Local to sign up for an event that they care about. We invite you to share in our vision of a world where everybody can meet that volunteering threshold because it is so easy to find and then sign up for volunteer opportunities in your local communities. So that's all really great. However, we are still a business and we do need to make a profit. And we do that with the different plans that we offer. Volunteer Local offers three plans. We have a free plan and then our two paid plans which are our Discover and our Grow. Now we do continue to offer a free plan because we recognize that there are a lot of organizations, smaller organizations out there that don't have any sort of budget for a system like this. And we still wanna provide them with a better alternative to say a spreadsheet. Now on the flip side, there are tons of organizations that find a lot of value in the features that they get with the Discover or Grow plans. These plans can be paid on either per event or per year for unlimited events basis. So essentially, we offer a plan that fits into every budget and every event need. In 2015, we experienced significant growth in every aspect of our business. In 2014, we served just over 100,000 unique volunteers, and it's August of 2015, and we're already on track to beat that number. Uh, right now, we're seeing about three to five new signups per day. Between January and May, uh, we had a 242% increase in sales, and our overall year-to-date revenue increase from 2014 is about two and a half times. So why the growth, and why specifically in 2015? Well, we did a few things differently this year. Instead of going after individual event coordinators and trying to convince them to use Volunteer Local, we instead went after national organizations that oversee the production of many similar events throughout the year, including USA Triathlon, United States Obstacle Course Racing, and I Am Athlete, a race registration company. We also made a new hire in 2015. That's Jenny right next to me. Uh, Jenny started at Volunteer Local in 2014 as an intern during the summer. We loved her so much we kept her on through the winter and the spring, and finally in July we made the full-time offer and we're lucky to have her on the team. We're socially connected. Uh, if you're on Twitter right now, I would encourage you to do a quick search, hashtag happy volunteering. That's the tweet uh, hashtag that we automatically embed into every tweet that comes out from Volunteer Local when volunteers want to share with their network that they're volunteering for a local event. Finally, notoriety. I've already mentioned uh, that we worked with Governor's Ball Music Festival. We also secured partnerships with Bonnaroo and Hangout Fest and many similar large events that gave us a little bit of credo in the music festival industry. So we also have some real evidence that the volunteers themselves are loving Volunteer Local. As Kaylee mentioned, we worked with Bonnaroo this past year and after the festival, we sent out a post-volunteering survey to Bonnaroo's volunteers. We got about 900 responses, which was really great, and we wanted to share some of those results with you. 
The one question we asked was how simple was the volunteer sign-up process for Bonnaroo this year? And as you can see, about 89% of the volunteers ranked the process as either extremely or very simple. Now, the other question pertains specifically to this new feature that we were sort of testing out with Bonnaroo, and this was the ability for Bonnaroo to collect their volunteers' credit card information in order to hold a deposit to reserve their spot. So we asked the volunteers, how convenient was paying your deposit through your volunteer profile? And here, about 94% of the volunteers said it was either extremely or moderately convenient. Now, we also pulled some of our favorite quotes that came directly from the volunteers from the survey. The first one reads, it was a wonderful experience and I definitely intend on coming back to volunteer. The process has been the best this year compared to other years. And finally, it was super easy, bro. <laughs> so because of this growth that we've experienced, we were able to recently launch a volunteer local mobile app. Now this app is free for download for volunteers. And as of now, the app has three main functions. First, the volunteer can check in and out of their shift on the day of the event. This saves a lot of time because volunteers don't have to wait in a long line at a checkout station or check-in station. Um, the second is that the volunteer can view their volunteer profile so they can see when their next shift is going to start, which helps reduce the number of no-shows that there are for shifts. And then finally, the volunteer can send messages directly to the volunteer coordinator, which helps to improve overall communication between staff and volunteers. And as Kaylee demonstrated with the Lollapalooza example, this open channel of communication can be extremely vital. So with an app, obviously, uh, we see a lot of room for growth, and we're looking to add new features and increase its overall functionality. In sum, Volunteer Local is a one-of-a-kind company. We are uniquely positioned between our social, altruistic vision to make the world a better place by getting more people volunteering more often, and our product's powerful ability to solve critical problems for our customers. And we offer the solution at a price point that can fit any budget, even no budget. So what's next? Well, we're really excited about the growth that we've seen in 2015, and our biggest challenge right now is how do we maintain that momentum? Uh, these are the things that we've kind of been playing around within the team. At this point, I'd love to open it up to feedback from our expert panel and uh, the group at WIDE. But basically, a special events package for music festivals, on-site coordinators, so in June we sent Jenny to New York City to participate at uh, Governor's Ball to help with the check-in and check-out. Later that month, we sent Cherish Anderson of Des Moines to Bonnaroo to help them execute volunteer local on-site. Uh, a corporate portal, we'd like to start to aggregate our volunteer opportunities and then create a framework where a corporation can provide those opportunities or push them out to their employees for employee giving. And then uh, my, our last question here, which is certainly not the least important, um, all those free users, we are not monetizing our free user base in any way. It's not a bait and switch. All those free users can export all of their volunteer data to their computers, um, and we are not ad supported. So what would you do if you had all those free users on your platform? Thank you, and happy volunteering. Great, we'll open it up to the panel first, and then we'll, then we'll have Q&A after that. Go ahead. Considering the wide range of startups we see on Stage, you're, you've got a fairly mature product, in my opinion. You're a fairly mature company. You've been around for several years. I have two questions on kind of the, one looking back, one looking forward. You mentioned the big five in terms of the problems you were solving for your customers. Did you start with a realization of those big five and, and then build a product to it, or did you kind of discover those big five along the way in the past few years? I'll speak to that one. Um, we started with the problem of scheduling. Volunteer Local was originally built for the Des Moines Arts Festival. If any of you are familiar, at the time it had 350 volunteers. The coordinator had a swamped inbox, um, too many voicemails, and she asked our developer, Brian Hemesath of Des Moines, to make her a solution. So we started with scheduling, and then we listened to our clients. Every new feature that we build in Volunteer Local that we've done in the past and that we're doing moving forward has been specifically requested by a client that works with us. So you started with one problem, you listened to your clients, you developed a list of big five, and you have a, what I would consider would be a mature product to solve those big five. And so now my second question is looking towards what's next. And you have a, you have a product market fit, it appears, in a, in, a, in a market that's established. How do you decide how much of your energy to go to scaling up what you already have created versus expanding the capabilities? Where, where's your thought process on that in terms of what's next? That's a great question. 
Um, of course, it's a, a feature race, right? So a good mentor of mine, Mike Colwell in Des Moines, once told me that anybody can match the features that you've created. So how do we stay ahead of the curve? How do we scale this thing while continuing to improve the product to provide the solutions that our customers need? And that's where we get to um, providing on-site coordinators. That's innovative, and those are our people that we're sending to, this, to those locations. Um, also, the corporate portal is an important part of that as well. So working with corporations to take all these opportunities that we already have in Volunteer Local and helping an organization like Wells Fargo to share those opportunities with their employees in a totally fully branded Wells Fargo portal. First of all, I um, echo his comments. You guys have a very polished presentation. Anybody that's considering presenting at One Million Cups, you should take notes. Um, <laughs> One of my questions is about future products that you could in, add on services. Have you considered any recruitment assistance, um, you know, platforms or um, add-ons for the um, organizations and um, in the nonprofit world? Um, I know that that recruitment process is really a huge problem, and so when you say it's top five. Um, that getting connected to people that want to volunteer that may not know about their organization is a huge issue. So how would you help bridge that gap? That, again, another wonderful question. Um, we've, if you go to happyvolunteering.com, we have a sister site where we tried to address that exact issue. We had clients that wanted to know, how can you help me recruit more people? Like, we provide the framework, we give them the scheduling software, but how do we help them to actually get that out to prospective volunteers? So happy volunteering was our first attempt at creating a forward-facing volunteer portal. Um, we've also been playing around with the idea of a panic button. So imagine in your volunteer local account, uh, you're two weeks before the event, you can click panic, and we'll charge you a fee to share your volunteer opportunities on Facebook. So we basically pay for Facebook ads, we optimize the spend, and then we track how many volunteers signed up through the ad, so you know how far your dollars went. Um, but I would love your feedback if you have more ideas as to how we can help in that regard. One last question from the nonprofit sector. Um, if you're assisting with the recruitment process in addition to the scheduling and the event management portion, um, do you have any plans to incorporate any background screenings, things like that, to help with the volunteer base? Um, not currently. Not currently. We've been asked if we do background checks, um, and it's something that we have looked at, but we do need to spend more time looking into that. No? You're waving me off? Okay. Let's open it up to uh, anybody else that has any questions, and we'll start with Brian back. Yeah, we got a question to your, to your right. Yeah, great presentation. Um, two questions. One, tell me about uh, how you got to your price points for your different levels. And then second on that one, if an event's 350 people and an event's 15,000 people, at the mid-level price point, is your profit margin the same? We actually used to have a month-to-month -month pricing, and it got really complicated um, because our clients would say, no, I want the upgrade turned off this month, and then we would have to retroactively either refund them or we would just give them the free upgrade for that month. We realized pretty quickly, um, actually in 2011, I believe, that our clients think in terms of their events. So you'll notice that we have per event pricing, and as Jenny stated, we have an annual plan. So if you're a Habitat for Humanity and you need to create you know, 50 events in any given year, you can do that and just pay one flat fee on Volunteer Local. Yes, an event that has 350 volunteers and an event that has 1,500 volunteers can both pay $200 for the Discover plan, single event upgrade, and they'll both get everything included in that package. Is your profit margin the same? Is your profit margin the same on that? It is. Okay. I have a question here in the middle. Guys, thank you so much for coming here. That was a wonderful presentation. Now, one thing that I really like about your, you guys is your app. But my question is about the app itself. Have you had pro problems with encounters with crashes, and how would you guys overcome that problem? Uh, so we launched the app this year, and it was used at Bonnaroo for the first time. Uh, we didn't have any crashes, although it was not widely used. So we didn't see a lot of downloads come through. Uh, Jenny, do you want to talk a little bit about the post-event survey and some of the, the feature requests that, that came through from volunteers about the app? Yeah, um, so in the comments of the Bonnaroo survey, we did have a lot of people asking for you know, more things in the app. Um, what they would like to see, the biggest one probably, is some sort of chat room capability where all of the volunteers can be in communication with each other. So you know, 
people build really strong friendships at these events, and then you know when they're done volunteering, they want to go and hang out um, with these people. So if there was some sort of chat room in the in the app itself, um, so yeah, we are looking to build in more features. I've got a question right up front. I've been involved with some golf tournaments that have raised a lot of money. Have you worked with volunteers and have you helped to raise money for charities through golf tournaments and do you go as far as even helping to get sponsors and stuff? We have worked with the first tee of Greater Des Moines. Um, they used Volunteer Local to recruit for their volunteers. Uh, we don't directly help with sponsors, but we are rolling out a new sponsor platform where a uh, coordinator at the $200 level, maybe they can't afford the $200 package, we've put together a template sponsor request uh, letter where we just give that to the coordinator and they can plug in their organization name, put their logo at the top, and then what we offer is the sponsor logo in all the emails that come out from the coordinator to the volunteers on the sign-up page and on the confirmation thank you for signing up page. So we tell the, the sponsor that they're gonna get their logo shown to this many volunteers if they contribute the $200 that the organization needs for the upgrade. They might have otherwise been on the free plan, but now they get the $200 package um, and we're still getting paid and we're helping them to get that sponsor in that way. Another one on right up the front. Very nice concept and nice presentation. Can you tell us a little bit about what else is out there that performs this particular service other than the spreadsheets and uh, that pile of paper you showed in your early slide? Sure, I'll let Jenny take this one. Yeah, so um, there are several other platforms that have a volunteer-specific scheduling and recruitment, uh, things like that. So like Volunteer Hub, Better Impact, Volunteer Spot. Um, and then we also compete with just general sign-up platform, so sign up genius, and then like you said, we compete with spreadsheets. Um, so yeah, in that regard, we, we compete with those kind of two different platforms. Question to your left. Um, so it, it seems like you're really more than just a, a tech company. It really seems like you're a consulting company for uh, people who are doing great volunteer events. So I have two, two questions. One, could you tell me a little bit more about the on-site coordinators? and how that works and how you interact with your customers. And two, to the people who volunteer, what, what's the importance of keeping track of the different volunteer experiences that they have? Why, why would you tell them that to, to the volunteers? Why is that a significant service that you provide? I can speak to um, being on site because I was in New York City in June at the Governor's Ball Music Festival. It's a huge music festival. Um, and so I provided on-site tech support for Sammy Slovey. Um, and just having that there, just knowing the ins and outs of the system was really helpful. Also having another hand helping with check-in and check-out because those lines can get very long, which is why um, the, the app will help with that. But um, they really found it to be useful to have me there to, to provide assistance in that regard. And then I'll take the second half of that question. Um, we have a very high touch sales process. So every time a client reaches out to Volunteer Local on the free plan and they say, we want to learn more about the Discover plan, why should I upgrade to that level or the Grow plan, we actually lead them through a live demonstration. And that's what we train our uh, salespeople to do. That's what Jenny does. That's what I do. Uh, we walk them through each feature, each benefit that they're going to get with the upgraded plan using a screen share and on a conference line, usually with multiple people on their end. Great. We got one more question to your left. My question happens to do with the intelligence behind the platform. Could it be expanded and used to possibly match up potential nonprofit board people to organizations? Can you explain how would you want it to match them based on their skills and interest? Yes, so you have people that may work for corporations that want to work on a nonprofit board or support a nonprofit and how a nonprofit might be able to seek them out so it would be a matching, so to speak. Can the intelligence behind this platform someday do that? I think it could. Let's talk after this. I would love to learn more. I have a question against the wall over here. Good morning. Um, so out of all the, I do a lot of volunteer coordination for events and charities. Out of all the other apps that you mentioned, there's a million out there and you mentioned a few. 
what would be the one or two reasons why I would choose you over everyone else? We're user friendly. Almost all these other software providers that do what we do are incredibly difficult to understand. So much so that the learning curve was so high that people have a hard time leaving them. The products end up being sticky because they've learned how to use them so well. Um, with Volunteer Local, though, when they see the platform and they see how easy it is, it's like a no-brainer for them. Uh, in addition, we offer unparalleled customer support. Every client on Volunteer Local gets a personal rep um, that they can work with. We're hiring actually right now. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, but between the user friendliness, the customer support, uh, really at the end of the day, it just comes down to the quality of the product itself. And we offer a lot of things that our competitors actually can't offer in terms of functionality on the back end. And you've presented at One Million Cups, so you got that going for you, <laughs> which is nice. All right, we've got one question in the middle. One suggestion on all those free users is if you offered a bounty for them to bring new clients to you, that will help with scale. So it's, let's say, 50 bucks for a $200 subscription, uh, 80 bucks for the $800 subscription. So one-time fee that they gather. They know of organizations that they work with that might be interested in it. They do the referral, they get some money out of it, and you get a new client. Do you know, um, if I may, do you know of any referral platforms that we could use to track when referrals come through and how they come through? Well, I guess I'm thinking of it in terms of a communication out to them that allows them to then come in and do a, kind of a sign-up process on your platform. So it's a pretty simple transaction. You'll, it'll require some tracking to make sure that it goes to the person that referred, but that may be one way you can monetize those users. I love it, thank you. I have a question against the wall. Good morning, very nicely done. My thought is around uh, vendors. Um, have you worked with vendors? I've, I've put on a lot of these different um, programs, volunteer programs in the past, and th they require an uh, enormous amount of vendors from tents, chairs, et cetera. Have you looked at trying to use this as an advertising or connect uh, the dots there? The other thing is finding volunteers is one thing, to, but, but finding very specific volunteers that have skills like lawyers, doctors, golf pros, people like that, more premium. Could you charge a premium to connect your users with more premium people that know how to do sound checks, set up sound boards, things like that? Uh, to your second point, that is a great idea. Um, I'm glad this is recorded. I'll definitely watch later and write that down. Um, I love that idea because we actually have a lot of people in the, in the system that I'm sure are qualified medical sound engineers, you name it, they have the skills and we could help to connect those people with similar opportunities with other events that need them. Uh, to your first question, um, sorry, what was your first one? <laughs> yes, vendors, thank you. Yep, yep, so we partnered with I Am Athlete, which is a race registration company, kind of a vendor. They provide um, registration services. They do everything except for volunteer management. And we did partner with them so that their clients can get a discount on Volunteer Local, um, and then they get a really good you know, volunteer management tool. Uh, we've tried reaching out to like fencing companies and stuff. Uh, we do go to a conference every year called IMFCon, which I'll be taking Jenny to in December, which brings together the vendors and the event coordinators. So it's something that we could pursue further, and, uh, and I think we should. Kaylee, Jenny, thank you so much. One final question for you, and that is, as a community, what can we do for you? So we have a few things listed. The first one, um, we talked about that corporate portal. We see a lot of potential with this. So if any of you have any insight, if you have experience working with corporations, and um, especially ones that do a lot of volunteer work, we would love to hear some of your ideas that you can offer. Uh, Jenny works at Think Big here in Kansas City. She lives here in Kansas City. She loves it. You guys live in a wonderful place. Um, we're trying to build a presence here. There are a lot of really cool events that happen. So if you know any event coordinators that could use a system like Volunteer Local and you don't want to feel like you're selling to them, go ahead and let them know that it's free forever and they can sign up on volunteerlocal.com. And then finally, we are looking to hire a part-time happy community builder. Um, this position would help with customer support requests that are coming in because next year we're anticipating a huge first quarter. Um, and then also managing a new form that we're gonna build. So if you know anyone who's interested, they can reach out to Kaylee or myself. Um, we also have a blog post on our website that has more details about the job. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for presenting.
We've got just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Adam Arredondo, if I can have you run up here for Startup Grind, and is Megan and Kurt here from uh, Make 48? Thanks. So a couple quick announcements. Actually, the first one is an ask. Uh, we organized Mecca Challenge, which is a day-long student innovation competition where we work with schools and or high schools and universities to have teams of students work on business problems for startups. Uh, we have five over the next six weeks and are looking for some mentors for that um, to work with those student teams to help them kind of work through the business process. I gave a couple of cards to Courtney if you'd be interested in that, there's a number of people here actually already that are mentoring. Um, I have to run, unfortunately, by the end of this, but Courtney has, has a couple cards. The other one is tonight, Startup Grind. We're hosting Sherry Turner of Women's Capital Connection, and we have uh, a few tickets still left, and I created a discount for one million cups, so it's just one MC, and you get 50% off. It's a, normally a $10 ticket, it's five bucks, and we provide food and beer as well. But that's tonight um, at Village Square in the Startup Village. Thank you, Adam. Um, if you haven't noticed, there are a couple of flyers on your seats. We'd like you just to take a look at those um, just right after One Million Cups. One of them is for the Disruption Institute if you want to learn how to develop iOS apps. There is also uh, a special program going, I believe, for Innovation KC. If you take a look at the large flyer, there's more details there. Um, so before we bring up our next presenter, one of the things we want to do um, is just show our appreciation of some of our supporters that are here for One Million Cups every Wednesday. If you have been here more than 10 times, please raise your hand. We want to give you a, a special presentation. We're going to select three of you. Um, Toby, I, I believe, is moving. Keep your hands up for just a moment. All right. Well, he's not raising his hand, but I know he's been here more than 10 times. So Marcus, Mr. Marcus, come on over here. Yeah, say hello, tell us who you Here's are. Here's a mug. Could you tell us why you come to One Million Cups and what you like about it, besides seeing me? Well, of course to see you, sir. Uh, I, you know, this, I love this Kansas City community. Basically, the, you guys are all my friends, you know? And so anytime I can come to One Million Cups, I get to hear about cool startups that are happening, visiting startups, and I get to see all the peeps that are uh, fighting a good fight, like the rest of us. So it's a great place to be on a Wednesday morning. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Brian, who do you got there with you? Uh, hello. I found Jennifer Kearns hiding in the back. <laughs> and I'm glad she raised her hand because now I don't have to just peg her with the cup. Jennifer, what brings you out to One Million Cups? Um, I'm actually back on old stomping grounds. I helped out with Nate Olson, who is also in the audience, start this thing up. Um, and it's good to see a lot of friendly faces who have been here a long time. Uh, like Matthew Marcus said, it's like coming to see friends and learn about all the new startups that are happening. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Let's see those hands again. We need one more person. Uh -huh, I know who we're going to talk to. All right. Hey, man. Hey. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Uh, Joe Rosenberger, I go by Rosie. Uh, I run my own consulting company, and I come. Uh, um, actually, the, the one million cups startups are really not my market. Um, there's not enough. Most startups don't have the have the money that I I, I typically charge. But I, uh, as a solopreneur, this is a, a recharge for me. I come here and just get uh, fired up, and. Uh, Obviously, if I can give back and coach and such stuff like that, I'm always open. But uh, this is, uh, I come here for, a, for a, a recharge. And here's your coffee mug to recharge for next week. Cool. All right. Thank you. So we'd like to go ahead and bring up Kirk Bowman from Zipline Labs is going to talk about how they move money around electronically, right? <laughs> That's great. Thanks. I think the mic is on. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we, one lesson we learned, and you'll probably see this this morning, one lesson we learned about um, a third of the way through our journey is when we stopped pitching and started telling our story, all of the things we wanted became a lot more effective. Fundraising, recruiting, strategic partnerships, sales, all those kinds of things. So uh, this is going to look a lot more like just a chrono chronological story of, of Zipline rather than a pitch. 
And it starts here, it starts in 2014, about a month before South by Southwest. We came up with an idea and entered a kind of a pitch competition, a prototype competition based on one idea. And the idea was this, forget everything you know about the financial system, banks, cards, even cryptocurrencies, and imagine a world where just keystrokes move money a frictionless world where keystrokes move money. We built a prototype that would simulate this or emulate this, and we walked into rooms at this prototype competition which had hundreds of people, and we kept seeing two things. Magical things happened, and we kept getting to the next room and the next room and the next room, and we ended up in the top five out of around 600 companies. So we came back uh, to St. Louis and said, let's, let's build something for this world. Now, of course, the world has uh, lots of friction, so we had to kind of come back to reality and make some decisions, and those decisions are, this is a current business curve. Everything you know about payments, everything you know about money, this is where the incumbents are really strong. Even if you get something out ahead of the incumbents, if you're on their curve, their money will win. So entrepreneurs, many times, have to think about the next curve. What, what's gonna happen next? because leaping from one curve to the next is not where the incumbents do very well, but that poses a problem. How do you explain to people a product on a curve that's not developed yet? So you kind of have to do a little reach back, reach back and say, okay, let's, let's think about some of the things that are out there that we have to kind of deal with now, but keep our eyes on the next curve and not on the current curve. So, so um, we started, with all these UX meetings and all of these coding meetings, and we came up with a thought, and that thought has really sustained us for 18 months, and that is this. Don't write code, don't draw pictures until you tell stories. Let's tell stories with our application, let's tell stories with our company, and when the story gets good or gets better, then things come to you and then you know what it is, and it takes a lot of patience and kind of rigor to do that, this is the kind of stuff we do when we try to tell stories. We want to make them stand up. This is a story called Sisters. So what this kind of format allows us to do, we'll go in and talk to an alumni association at a college and we'll make a video like that that has buildings that only the alumni would know and restaurants and little inside things and it lets that customer kind of identify with these stories and it, and it kind of makes us better. Um, so what we did first, we had to build a money engine. We call our money engine Chameleon. I'd love to go into the details about Chameleon because we love it, but it's, we call it Chameleon because it's one of the most adaptable money engines we've ever seen. And by adaptable, we mean it handles all of the systems, not just one of the systems. When we deployed Chameleon, we, did, we chose Rackspace, we deployed Chameleon, and we had a long conference with their DevOps team about how we wanted to do security. And two calls later, they said to us, we've never seen security done like this, this is amazing. Um, will you come teach our, they call them rackers, will you come teach our rackers and our customers what you just did? And so this is a, just a little bad visualization of our first product. It's just, this is just our administrative dashboard, but this is kind of where we started, ACH files. I don't know if you want to see how low tech our banking system is, this is how it works. <laughs> But within about a month um, of deploying that first thing, we were on stage at a conference teaching Rackspace employees and Rackspace customers how we did our security. And this kind of launched something pretty cool for us. Somebody saw us at this place as we were building the next piece of our API, which is called Gecko. And this is, we just call it Gecko around the office. This is the thing that does real-time tokenized conversation. We don't know anybody that has a chat or a messaging engine that is tokenized with the, you know, the security of things like the, like the security that Apple Pay brags about tokenization, that is built into our messaging platform. 
we uh, deployed this and were invited to Money 2020 down in Vegas last year. And um, we got a little funding and were, were able to build our team. One of the things that was great uh, that we have uh, five of us are full time, two part time. One of the great things about Money 2020 is that, um, um, the, is that before we built our mobile app suite, when we were at Money 2020, um, we were able to go tour Zappos. And we saw this currency thing happening at Zappos. We saw somebody actually just photocopying color money. They were cutting out money and, and we looked and we said, what is that? And they said, um, well, we call these Zappos bucks. And I kind of said, do, do you, is it interesting how, you, how this economy works? And this lady grabbed me by the arm and she goes, you know what's great is she said, we had no idea what was gonna happen here. We made Zappos bucks as an incentive currency and it's become a recognition currency. And that set our mind to thinking. So as we were building our mobile app suite with our team, we were looking for an opportunity to kind of build out this, we, we were gonna do the mobile apps. We'd already kind of done this platform as a service side of our company. We said, who would wanna hear the story about what happened at Zappos? And we thought, well, we know, let's tell Rackspace. They are one of the 100 best companies to work for. There's this HR solution out there that we think might work in a currency environment. Let's talk to them about that and see what would happen. We talked to them and this, beca this became another kind of rocket ship of propulsion for us. And uh, their CEO made a little video with us to kind of introduce this program, I wish I could tell you. At Rackspace, we look for companies that are on an inspiring mission, who are out to make a dent in the universe and change things in a meaningful way. We first got to know the Zipline guys when they deployed their API with our DevOps team. And since then, we've become more and more excited about what they're doing. So excited, in fact, they've joined us on stage at our Rackspace Solve events to talk to our customers about the mission they're on and how they work with Rackspace. We reviewed the attendee feedback from our Solve conference, and we noticed that Zipline scored second only to our keynote speaker in terms of positive feedback. Their passion was infectious. Their mission is exciting. So in January, we invited them to be one of two companies to address all 6,000 Rackers at our 2015 company kickoff. Today, I'm excited to get to introduce Kirk Bowman and Glenn Selly and their team back in St. Louis who represent Zipline. Ask them about the project they're working with us on. We think you'll be as excited and intrigued by it as we are. I'd love to spend 10 minutes telling you about how we're reinventing uh, horizontal recognition at one of the greatest, um, you know, basically workplace environment companies in the world. But this became, out of this idea that currency could flow with keystrokes, this became um, a, a, a direction for us to pursue based on the technologies that we built. So we added this idea of creating our own coin with characteristics that aren't necessarily for purchasing things. So we kind of, we were able to think about a world where Money is not just about buying stuff. Money is maybe about recognition. It may be about learning, uh, teaching kids to read, other kinds of things that, that coins with characteristics can do. And then we went out and started kind of doing our sales process, both raising money and sales. And, we, and because we build our, built our APIs like we had, we were able to kind of go at different people different ways. Conversations with Slack, we actually are testing now moving money on Slack with keystrokes, very exciting thing for us. Um, and and um, we our next conversations that we already have meetings with them, but no agreements with them are for some of these other, other conversation engines. They don't need our apps. They don't need conversation. They've got apps and they've got conversation, but they would love to have keystroke money so they can, they can look at us in this direction. Uh, banks don't have conversation and they don't have the v versatility of money that we have, so they might use us in a different way. Uh, local uh, restaurant, where we have two contracts and um, three others that are just about there, the drafts are out there. They don't have mobile apps that do what we do, and they also don't have any of these things, so they kind of use our suite in a different way. Um, and um, again, we got invited back to Money 2020. Again, my, uh, our team jokes that I'm much younger as a cartoon. We saw this tweet last week uh, come out. And, and we're going to Money 2020 to introduce the rat coin thing. And I, uh, I'll love to tell you a little bit more about it in the Q&A portion. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I will tell you, I went to the website 
was the, what not a lot of information on the website um, about processes. So right. that that's some feedback for you. Um, did download the app. Okay. I sent her five bucks. We'll see if she gets it tomorrow. <laughs> um, hopefully, it's in her bank account and not out there in cyberspace somewhere. Um, I'm confident that it'll work. Great. One of the things that I noticed as I went through the app and actually went to send money is that it required my checking account information right. mm -hmm. and no credit or debit card option. Right. Um, right. Is that in the plans for the future? And um, would adding that feature allow for a quicker transfer of money instead of next day? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, not, nev there's nothing quicker than next day. Credit and debit cards, it's, it's, uh, it's smoke and mirrors. When a merchant swipes the card and they get that confirmation code, they get a confirmation code. They don't get money the same day. Um, they get, if you ask any merchant, they actually get spendable money days later. Um, wire transfers cost a bunch of money, and sometimes bank to bank can happen instantly, or if, you're, if your money is moving within the same institution. So it doesn't necessarily speed up the process. And one of our difficulties is the debit card system, that's where all the leakiness is in the world. The, it's, if, if you read about all the hacks, if you, get, you know, if you read down to the seventh or eighth paragraph, it's always the debit card. It's not that they stole your check. It's not that they, it's never American Express. It's always the debit card. So, so we have work to do with that system, both from a speed and security standpoint. I just know that the younger generation is not necessarily opening up bank accounts. Correct. They're getting their pay on pay correct. cards. So if we were correct. to send money, right. they can't receive it without a bank account at That's this correct. point. That's correct. And, and, and we know that and, and are trying to address it, but it's a, it's a more difficult problem. And, and that opens up, your question really opens up a, a different thing, which is like prepaid cards. And that is, um, we're gonna roll that out actually before debit cards so that people can you know, load and move money. Right now, if you have a prepaid card, there's no way to get credit from one card to the other. And we're, um, there's a company called Green Dot, and we now have um, uh, a meeting but not a pilot to do to recredit that, and that is instant. So, so there's basically two, uh, well, there's two kinds of money systems in the world. There are batch systems. The old ones are all batches, ACH and credit cards, debit cards. And there are APIs, Bitcoin, instant credit, like Starbucks, those kind of things. And what's nice about the prepaid card system is it's an API-driven system, which is where the world is headed, which is why those legacy systems have to go away, because batches are dying. So let me make sure I have your story correct. You said you were in a prototype competition in 2014, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And then you, you told me that you also raised some money to move from prototype to where you're at today. How much money has been? We raised a half a million dollars in our seed round and that happened over about 10 months. So you're able to successfully win a prototype competition, come back, develop the idea, raise the money, use the money to build the product to where it is today. Grow the team, right? Grow the team. Right. And so what I see is a lot of potential, a lot of different directions. As you indicate, you know, this is, there, there's, there, this ecosystem is big that you're playing in. Right. Now, you, you seem to have a singular vision in terms of you know, reducing friction to moving money to currency flow with keystrokes. Those are a couple words I heard you say. Okay. As you look to the next iteration, the next round for Zipline, because this product clearly has a couple more iterations left in it right. before it, it probably gets to a maturity, right. At what point do you, how, how do you frame the decision in terms of let's keep innovating, let's keep the, the doors open, let's really try to figure out what this stuff is versus locking in and saying, here's the direction we're going to go right. with our next round of funding? That's a great question. We didn't even know, we didn't know the answer to that question. We um, hired an attorney on the West Coast, one of the big law firms, um, and they rejected us twice and then decided to, on the third time, third time was a charm. And that attorney introduced us to fund, two funding sources on each coast and one in the Midwest. And we interviewed them and they basically said, here are the milestones that'll get you to a round of funding. Um, and there were some of them were surprising to us. Um, not one time did one of them ever mention the word revenue, um, for instance. So we, um, we started making our next year's plan toward that milestone and then just recently actually closed a mezzanine round yes yesterday for what's next. And what's next, the milestones are to pilot the RatCoin project. The RatCoin project um, 
and, and the other one is to do an integration, keystroke integration into at least one application that has worldwide reach like Slack. So, so there, there's clearly an innovative team behind this product. You all are, are moving quickly, innovating a lot. At some point, there, there needs to be some a, a revenue generating focus, I suspect, coming out of this. Right. At what point does that integrate in with the innovative team that you have versus maybe something separate that basically says, okay, here is Zipline, here's this innovative suite, here's this team that's gonna continue to innovate. Right. We're gonna start to spin off revenue generating products out of this. Right. When we started in the RackCoin talks, that's about the time we were talking to the venture capitalist. And we asked them a pretty simple question. We said, would you rather see us build something that we think Rackspace wants and then sell it, try to sell it to them? Or would you rather us take our technology as it is, go in and tell them our story, ask them some questions, and collaborate with a company who has a high standing in the world in that particular silo, which is HR. And they said, definitely the latter. Because if you, so, so the stage that we're in is, you know, um, is looking for, a, you know, key collaborators to take the current technology, technology that we have and then ask them what, you know, what is the value for you? What did we just do for your company? Because, you know, it would, and that's where you get your pricing models and revenue models and things of that nature. Kirk, I got a question to your yes. left. Hey, Kirk. Thanks hey. for coming all the way from St. Louis and welcome to Kansas City. Um, I love these types of products. I use Square Cash probably daily. Right. Um, what I think is so interesting about St. Louis Squ founders. What yeah. What I what I love about Square Cash especially is because um, they've done a great job uh, with. You know, in the early days of Square Cash, it was like, um, hey, I want to send 10 bucks to my brother, but he doesn't have the app. Correct. So it would text him, right? And then right. say, download the app, you have $10 waiting. Right. Right. I'm sure you guys are dealing with that right. challenge. Um, and I'm also interested to learn, you know, what types of things you're doing inside of the app. For example, in the sister scenario, all three sisters have to have the right. app. Correct. And so what I love about Square Cash is I can see who in my contacts has the app already right. that I can send it to. So what type of stuff are you doing inside of your, your user experience to kind of make it easier to acquire new customers, uh, whether that be sending them a text, and then also, you know, what are you doing in terms of showing who you have already in there, you know, so to make it easier? We built the app mostly for auxiliary customers who don't have some other place to use us. We just happened to do it first because we knew that it needed to be out there and needed to be developed. And real time, for those of you who've built apps, I, I heard a question in the last round about crashing, like real time things in apps, that, that, that's like crash city. So we didn't want to wait until we were keystrokes in other people's apps and say, oh, now we need to build an app suite and then you know, have to throw a bunch of money at that problem. So it was a little bit out of order, but it's a, it's a great testing type of situation. We don't, um, we, we knew early that having people down, uh, here's where we got our intel, it was pretty simple. I sat at a door of a shopping mall <laughs> and people would come in and I would say, do you have PayPal? And if they said no, I would walk away. If they said yes, I would say, do you have a PayPal app on your phone? And the answer was always yes, no. Everybody has a PayPal account. Not that many people have PayPal app on their phone. And so it, it it came evident to us that in this space, the way people think about it, having an account with Zipline, somehow we have a record where you can log in with credentials to other things, is more important than actually having the app. Hope that answers the question. Question here in the back. Yes. I actually have a ton of questions. Uh, it's <laughs> very interesting. Um, I, I, it's a lot of different directions you could look at this, but I'm particularly interested in the keystroke um, aspect and and you talk about uh, looking into the future and, and pre-disrupting another industry. Um, how confident are you that we'll still be doing a lot of texting in five years, or or have you thought about the future of communication? If you're looking that far into the right, future to, right. to, to validate your idea and and how prevalent you think text will still be in, in five years? Yeah, that was a. Interesting, you know, we, we kind of made this decision a year and a half ago when we saw people kind of flying away from social network type of paradigms, you know, double opt-in and some of those UX experiences toward 
messaging, and so it was kind of validation for us when Facebook paid a bunch of money for WhatsApp and you know, et cetera. Um, the, the future thing that we look at the most is, until about three years ago, the cost of managing a currency system was huge, is huge. Think about how much the United States spends on our currency system. It's billions if you add up all the banks and the ATMs and the pneumatic tubes and all that kind of stuff. Or you take a company, even a, even a fake currency, like say airline points, you know, there are hundreds of people working at an airline managing that system. Since it's a high cost, there's only one thing that you can kind of validly do with currency, right, would be buying stuff. Commerce can absorb the cost, the high cost. Now think about a world where it doesn't cost that much to, to manage a currency system, which is the world we're going into. So we know that currencies will do things that otherwise would have been too expensive to have a currency system to do. For instance, the Ratcoin project, they basically just gave us two parameters. They said, we would like to connect all of our people, see what kind of groups they form, and we want to create these coins, but here's what we want to do. We don't want them to be an incentive program, so we want to put five coins a week in all 6,000 employees' wallets, but when they land there, we would like the coins to be inactive. We want to make a clear signal that this isn't compensation and this isn't an incentive, and the coins can only be activated when they're given to a colleague. And so that simple rule then created not a vertical system, but a horizontal system. And so I guess those are kind of the futures that we're building into. We think, whether it's texting, we think if you, if you would call it real-time conversations, we think we see the web moving toward real-time everything. It's, you know, nothing is static or stationary anymore. So we're kind of building toward real-time and currencies doing behaviors other than just at the cash register. That answers your question. Kirk, I got a question to your left. My question has to do with uh, what is your difference between you and like something like PayPal? Right. So their, their emphasis is definitely the cash register. You know, they are, they are about, you know, real money buying things. They do have some products where people can send money to each other, but it's not very much an emphasis of theirs. It's kind of an also thing. So we developed this saying around the office. I don't know if this is true or not. I'd like some challenge on this. We developed this saying that today's feature is tomorrow's platform. Think about all the, think about all the great companies that somebody else had a feature first. We, we talked about messaging platforms back there. If I would have been WhatsApp trying to raise money in 2008, somebody would have said to me, well, I already have texting. You know? But the phone companies thought of texting as a feature. They didn't think of it as a platform. WhatsApp builds it as a platform, and there's a you know, $19 billion story there. You know, on my first AOL portal back in the 90s, it was like weather, stocks, news, sports, uh, search. Google said, hey, let's, search isn't a feature, it's a platform. Dropbox said, hey, you know, you know, it's not, you know, um, file sharing isn't a feature, it's a platform, et cetera, et cetera. So we, um, we see um, the people that are doing payment now, they're, they're doing kind of things like this, Snapchat, you can put a dollar sign in front of a Snapchat, Facebook Messenger, you can put, but they're, they see it as a feature and not as a platform. And that's, that's, how, that's why we're trying to distinguish that when we, when we raised money in this round, and, and, the, and the funding sources got it, at least to the level that we were able to uh, raise, you know, in terms of some of these companies, a little bit of money. So since I know, you, I think you have an extra slide. Oh. Um, oh. I would like to ask you, what can we as a community do to help you? Oh, um, we really are interested. Um, our, um, we, we are live testing our app, just, you know, the best way to get, the, <laughs> I hate to say this, the best way on a low budget to get crash reports is to just let people use it and then, you know, get the crash reports. Uh, um, testing is difficult. So um, iOS is where we, we lead with our iOS product. But primarily, I'd like to find developers who have conversations in their applications or who think in ways that various behavioral currencies that we can make on your own, the rack coin, we move that currency instead of with a dollar sign with keystrokes. We, we're using the keystrokes of their stock symbol. So when they're on Slack or when they're in our app, they just type R-A-X and it triggers Ratcoin. Um, we would love, uh, if you have ideas or would love to collaborate with us, we would love collaborative partners who would want to add keystrokes moving 
money or other currencies inside their applications. Great, thank you so much thank for you. being here today. Great, I have um, one final announcement today. We actually have an event tomorrow at the ECJC where Grant Gooding, who's on our panel a lot, is doing a brand positioning presentation from 10.30 to 12.30, so we hope that you all can make it. But thanks for coming this week. Um, some great presenters. If you have any questions still for them, they will be over here answering your questions. We'll see you soon.